when they asked me to come up here and talk, and this is probably one of the hardest uh, presentations I had to put together because it required a lot of introspect into my career. And, uh, you know, my wife thinks now, in the position I'm in, I'm actually really unemployed. Uh, generating prospects isn't seem what she used to think is a living. But, uh, you know, looking back at your career and where you are today, and you say, well, would I have, did I get here because I planned to get here? Or did I get here uh, through just a matter of uh, weird circumstances? And, and I will tell you that uh, I got here on purpose. I, I planned to be here in this position in, in my career. And I think that's what a lot of people uh, are looking for is, are we, are we done? And no, they'll, you know, they'll pry that pencil away from me when, when I'm no longer available and 30 minutes later all of my geology books will be on eBay. But, uh, <laughs> or, and my fishing gear. Uh, but, you know, I, so I look back at the career and I said, you know, what is it, wh where did I, where did this whole Half start and now it's not a not from point A to point B because it, it was a you know a line that didn't go straight and I had a lot of really good mentors and, and Dan, Dan Tierpock being one of those and I will tell you this is a short note Tenneco did a lot of look back and a lot of times Dan would come and do an audit on your maps sometimes you didn't want that to happen I can tell you that right now we were most our little group was probably more successful than other groups, but we didn't drill a lot of dry holes. But our success rate still wasn't anywhere near what people would claim it to be. But Dan was quite one of those guys, and you know, when he published the book on subsurface mapping, and we said everybody has to have a copy, and most of the people, even at that time, said, I already know how to make a map. Why, why do I need another book? And they didn't realize that the value in what we do is in things like that and many other things. So let's look at career versatility and I'll, I'm gonna try to correlate my history into some sort of future through a series of slides. Some I'll talk about, some I won't. Now, I did put a background on all these slides because I think most of us start our careers by literally picking up rocks and looking at the earth. And so each one of these slides is a whole bunch of those, and I, I, I put down where they came from, what the slide, the picture is, and I have a whole bunch of these. I, I actually had got these from a, from a, 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 a little group that's on, that basically says, hey, look, this is geology. This is why you want to be a geologist. And that's what I think we all ultimately have. So let's see, dive into this and see where, where it goes from, from here. Uh, I'm gonna I'll just give you a little family history. And then I'm going to talk some personal experience along the way. I'll show you some antidotes and some things. Uh, maybe explain, hopefully, my career direction. Uh, and then a little bit about exploration. I know that people have talked about that. Now, uh, just a touch at the end on future, because we are facing, uh, uh, maybe, uh, we definitely are facing changes in the industry. We don't know what those changes are, but we kind of have, I think, as a group here, you guys all have a good handle on what, that, what those changes look like they're going to be. I will give you one little deal at the end. I'm not sure that this hasn't been thought about before, and we just never know where to go. But the industry has been very resilient in finding hard carbs, and we continue to do so. And I feel that through what we recognize in our history, we can continue to do that in the future. So uh, Cecil Green, and most of you may or may not have known him, but he was uh, uh, one of the founders of uh, Geophysical Services, Inc., GSI. Uh, Ultimately, that spun off Texas Instruments, Texas Instruments, and then in fact bought GSI. And the long thing goes, and, and Cecil Green was one of those guys that you, you ran into in, in being more from a geophysical background, you know, at the at, at SCG, and he was a great mentor to, to literally hundreds of people. And, and his uh, endowment, they didn't have any kids, him and his wife didn't have any kids, so they actually put buildings named after him in all the campuses around. If you go, you'll find a lot of times you'll find a Cecil Green. Uh, 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 endowment or a deal. So he said, you know, perfect combination of, of technology and people. Now, mind you, when he wrote that this was, this was in the, in the 70s, uh, uh, you know, the high demand of science, breed integrity and, and, and modesty, he says. And then he goes on to say, show me a geologist or a geophysicist who's brimming with ego, and I'll show you a probable newcomer to this business. Mother Earth has a way of quickly showing you you're not always on the upstart. And I think, if anything, 
uh, you learn in this industry is it's not, there's not a lot of room for ego. There's a lot of room for enthusiasm, but enthusiasm isn't necessarily the same thing as, as, as ego. So, the oil and gas industry. That's, I keep this long list, of, you say document things, I keep a long list of events in the oil and gas industry and I always look back to see if things are because what's, you know, what's old is gonna be new again, and et cetera, et cetera. And I put this together and I did it because I wanted to show how I got in this industry. And I got into it probably because my father said, that's what you're gonna do. And I, you think well, that's kind of a bad thing. My dad did not teach me uh, to throw a baseball. I don't think his father taught him to throw a baseball, but he taught me how to contour a map. And that was probably when I was 15 years old. He was a, he, and I'll talk a little bit more about him, but you say, oh, well, can you throw a ball? I can throw a ball, but not very good. I was not the big sports guy, but it, it doesn't matter. So you look at this industry, and I put a couple of key points in here, and I'm, I'm hoping the mouse, uh, if you can see the mouse, I don't know, you probably can't see the mouse, but the, the is there a laser pointer? Great, not a laser pointer. Technology. There you go. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to walk over here and I'll point out a couple of things. And you know, I, I started this about 18 1800s. I could have gone back to what, when oil was originally done, about 500 uh, BC, when they started recognizing it as something. But I, I put it. I put a couple of things in here. I put the, the start of um, World War One, uh, World War Two, and the Korean War, mainly because those were the influences. Of, of, of my generations, or past generations, that our family history. So I have a, a, you know, and I'll show you that, but then I put some other things into here, like in the 50s when Slumberjay actually said, here's the first well log. We think well log's been around for a long time. So it wasn't. When I was introduced to the Slumberjay brothers, it was for surface electrical methods. We learned them in, in, in college, the principles of of doing electrical surveys on the surface, they eventually put those down whole. And then eventually in the 50s said, hey, that's a tool for logging in a wall out. Look at the business they built from that. And then you come all the way down here until you know, 2004, 2005, when horizontal wells have exceeded, exceeded vertical wells. I'm not saying that horizontal wells are all unconventional. I think horizontal drilling is a technology that all I'm, I'm gonna try to talk you into embracing, but it's not the, it's not the panacea by any means but it's a tool that we were developing along the way. So when we look at this and we, you, you go back and look at my family history and, and I said, okay, so, because you know, I'm third generation. Actually, I went all the way back to the 1700s and, 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 and the one side of the family were all engineers and surveyors. I go back to my grandmother's side and they ran the, the ferry across the Sabine River. And, and which was great. I mean, they, that was a, a real good deal during the Civil War and, until, well, then you had eight kids and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually, they, what, what replaces a ferry technology, which at that time was a bridge. And so a couple of the uh, younger ones of that family became bridge builders. Bridge builders were basically, they became engineers. Engineers, and then they spread across. Eventually, a lot of them ended up in the hill country, and that's where the real family uh, homestead was, just north of San Antonio. And, you know, they helped build the Medina Dam. So it was in the family. It's always been the family breeds engineers, geologists, geophysicists. We have, I have a cousin that teaches in, uh, in, uh, in Provo. I mean, I have, there's a whole bunch of us out there that it seemed like there was something set up the, the deal for it. So when you look at this, I, I put my grandfather's timeline on there. So here's, here's my grandfather. He started at roughly 1900. By the time he was of mature age, he went to World War I. And he fought, came back, and became an engineer and a geologist. My father follows along, you know, roughly 30 years later, in, 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 uh, in the, in, in, and he comes out, and so he, he, he follows up. He, what does he do? He, Depression times, he ends up on a ranch in, in Montana, and then, now that's how I got to Montana, but anyway, so he ends up on Montana, and then what happens there is, Korea breaks out, and he's 16 years old, and decides I'm gonna go to Korea, and he goes to Korea, comes back, doesn't really wanna be a rancher, what's he decide to be? An engineer, a geologist. So when I come along, you know, a few years later, that's probably a little bit long, the timeline there. 
what do I get? I have a history of people that have been banging on rocks and I didn't know anything different. So, you know, voila, I, I become a geoscientist. Actually, at that time, they called us, they were education, we called geophysicists. Now, one thing I will point out here is, so my grandfather, Paul, this particular grandfather, was a civil engineer. Because at the time, if you look at that, go back and look at this, if you look back at the time, and you look back in the early 1900s, there was a lot of stuff going on in the oil business, but we didn't, they didn't <coughs> spit out geologists in the sense of exploration geologists or even geophysicists, because geophysics hadn't even been invented yet. We didn't, those weren't put out in the universities because there wasn't a demand. They didn't know. So those people who were civil engineers were the likely candidates. When the geophysical industry came along in the 50s, who were the geophysicists? Electrical engineers. Most of them were either electrical or some were chemical engineers. I know a really uh, classic one. He was uh, actually had a degree in meteorology. He went from weather because weather, predicting weather was very applicable to predicting seismic. And so they, they were some natural. You go like, oh my God. It was a completely, I used to think of it as completely bastard. Uh, uh, industry. It, you could be anything and you could still do well. And I know Charles is back there and we, he's, I've heard him host seminars. They go like, well, here's Clayton Williams. He's got a degree in animal husbandry or something, you know, and here's, you know, Herbert Hunt who didn't know anything but geology. So it doesn't, the industry isn't really specific. And that's kind of the points I'm trying to get across is we have to make ourselves broader and it really becomes our own deal. So let's talk a little bit about so here's, you know, my grandfather, and uh, you know he's born in Ohio. He comes down to to Texas, and he eventually marries my grandmother. But in, in the process of that, he goes to the, he's in the Navy, First World War, comes back, and and he wants to become an engineer. Well, GI Bill would have been a perfect deal. My father used that, but but here he he he's, he went to the industry. Let's go. I'm going to build dams and bridges, and that dams and bridges and surveying and he had and I have them he has I have like 60 of these and what they are there were books that were sent to him in the mail and each one's on a different topic and you would you would read the book do the examples go down to the school somebody certified somebody certified would, would let you take the test under their tutelage and they'd mail it off and you would eventually you get a degree in civil engineering so I have his textbooks. They're all published right around 1920, 1930, and that's how you learned it. And it wasn't one topic. It was a lot of topics. This one I think I picked up was on uh, uh, kinematics, uh, hydrostatics, and pneumatics. I mean, these guys, I mean, I have one that tells, you know, it's just like on building um, hand grenades, uh, one, you know, on, on fortifications. There's uh, ones on geology. Uh, I have three copies of this book. Everybody in this room probably has one. Dana's Book of Mineralogy. Oh, yeah. I have three different vintages. This is, a, this is a 1906 vintage. I have a deal with my wife. I can only keep a book if it's 100 years old <laughs> or more or signed by an author. Because, <laughs> you know, we, it takes a, you have a lot of books, right? So that's how he got. So then he goes, he takes that knowledge of his and says, what we, the, the, the oil business at that time, you think in the 30s and 40s, was becoming very much like the gold rush. And people in seeking a fortune. Let's, you know, he had been in Midland, he saw this, he knew he could apply his, his, his trade, his engineering trade, and his, his love for geology. And, you know, he ends up in, uh, in uh, 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 Venezuela on some of the uh, oil fields, that, not the first ones, the first ones were found. Uh, right around 1900, but he was there when they started really developing Venezuela. Good, bad, or ugly, that's where he was. And it's fun because today on the internet, I actually go, went back and found the uh, documents that came from uh, the immigrations that, you know, when he, would, when he would return from Venezuela, and they said, hey, you know, Paul Bowman was on this ship returning from Venezuela at different times. And so that's what, that's what he went to do. And he did it for his entire life. So my father, and my father and, and my grandfather didn't necessarily, in fact, I, they never really met each other. But the, 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 it doesn't matter, the, the change in the industry was there. So now it comes uh, David uh, in the 30s, 
uh, lives in the Depression, goes to Korea underage. Now back then, you could go to war, fight for your country, um, if you had your wisdom teeth. That was how they determined how old you, if you were old enough to go. So he obviously had his wisdom teeth, and so he went to Korea. Uh, came back, and he went to school in, in uh, now mind you, my father never finished uh, the sixth grade. It's just all he could do, depression, grandmother had five kids, grandpa was gone. So all of them became engineers or schooled uh, in college. She did a very good job of making sure. My father, because that goes to, uh, goes to Oklahoma, part of the oil business, gets a degree in engineering. Focuses at that time on, really on things that he thought he could apply straight to, which was, in this case, back to bridges. It seems like there's a theory there too as well, but he was very much, uh, he became a registered surveyor and he, and he went into, and did a lot of stuff in the oil business and then he ultimately got out of that. But this bridge here is over the uh, uh, Rio Grande at the Gorge, just north of Taos, a few miles north of Taos, and uh, built in 1963, and he, he was one of the engineers on it. And, and that was, that's what he did. So when he thought about geology, when I, when I would go out with him as a, as a young child and follow him around, it was about, to him, geology didn't necessarily think about subsurface geology. It thought about surface geology. That's where he did. So we did a lot of water stuff, but surface geology. Because he had to build a bridge and support that bridge. You want to make sure that geology you're putting it on a dam. You know, had the geology to, to, to be able to build it, to put it there. And so I would travel, I'd go with him on different places, and we, we, would, we would look at all this stuff. And he would also, other thing he caught me on early on was, was like, uh, you know, cut, excavating for roads. And if you knew the geology and you knew what you were getting into, you'd do a much better job building that highway, better price, than you would if you didn't. If you knew what kind of rock it was, if you knew how stable it was, you knew what kind of road cuts to make, you knew what kind of angles to apply. I love road cuts. It's still to my day, if I see a road cut on the highway, and my kids will tell you that, and my kids are all grown, we just hit, let's stop and look at the road cut. Uh, because I, I learned so much about geology from that, just, you know, that kind of deal. So he, eventually he, he became a federal mineral surveyor, worked for the, as, for the federal government, but, and he was on the board of, of uh, it was appointed in Montana to be the board of, uh, uh, of registration for scientists, uh, of, uh, mainly uh, engineers at that time, engineers surveyors. So he was the one to give the exams out and, and grade the exams. And he did that for the last part of his life. And that was, that was a big deal to him. So when they decide, hey, we're going to register uh, 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 scientists in Texas, geologists and, or geoscientists, geophysicists, I called my father. I said, what do you think? He said, do it. He said, well, said, but you don't really need to do it for the oil and gas. And she said, do it, because when you have that, when you have these certifications, you have a standard to live up to, another, another thing to judge yourself on. So you're going to think about it differently when you have a license at, at risk. It gives you subconsciously a drive that some people don't have. So, you know, I obviously followed that deal. So here, uh, and this is, this is a standard employment brief, and, and, and the only reason I put up here is because, you know, it says, oh, hey, you know, he started in here and he did that, blah, 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 blah. And it doesn't really tell you anything. I mean, I've been all over the world, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I've done a lot of things from, from Siberia to South Texas, that, which is it's the same thing as Siberia. It's just a little closer to home. And so that literally, and I put it here because this is what we all live for. This is the experiences that we have, and this is where we're ultimately going. So when you start off as a geologist, you want those experiences. It gives you that pedigree, it gives you that experience, it gives you that opportunity. And, and the thing is, sometimes you're lucky enough to have it given to you. It's like, you need to go there, and you need to go here, but there are a lot of times when you don't have that. And so if it's, not, it's up to you, it becomes more your deal. And I, and I we talked about, I guess we're talking about mentoring these young guys. I go out to San Diego every year, and, and, and they're competing in the uh, Barrel Award, got second last year, not this year, and teaching these kids that, because they don't learn it in school, but in some schools they do, but it's not as prevalent. We have to learn it, we continue to learn it. So I put the next slide in here, and this, this is probably gives you a little bit better habit. So this is where my father said, and I must have been, I don't know, nine years old or something, and, and he, he, we're, we're going through Butte, he's on his way to Helena to, to do a registration thing, and he, he points out Montana School of Mines, Montana Tech, 
Montana College of Mineral Science and Technology. They've changed its name again. And this is a you know, picture here of old Marcus Daly. And he says, that's where you're going to go to school. Sounds good to me. Ultimately, I tried not to. I wanted to go to A&M, but my father had a deal for A&M. He didn't like A&M. I, I don't know why. He never told me. But uh, bottom line, it was funny. I pulled this picture up, and, and that, that room, it's right. There's a window, right? That was my dorm room. That is the dorm. It's that big. It, it's, it, it's only three stories. We, it was 19. That dorm was still there, the only one. It was 19 guys to every girl. You weren't there for party, and you might have drank a lot of beer. It was strictly there for education, just truly for education. You know, along the way, I did surface work, a mill cam. I did work a lot of work for the Bureau of, uh, of Geology. And actually, a uh, funny sideline story, you can see the M up on the hill. That was a big deal for, for, for Montana Tech. And if they won one of the little sports deals, which sports in a mining college, they would make the V blink. But being in a mining and engineering school, one of our buddies ended up with about 1,000 pounds of Pentalite explosive. Geophysicists understand what that is, but it's basically, you know, it's what it amounts to is uh, fertilizer with a little bit of diesel gel, and you squirt it in there and put a blasting cap in and blow things up. And so we, he brought it back with his father from uh, a mine in Canada, the back of his pickup truck, you know, and we were using it to harvest uh, crystals uh, and things up on the batholith to sell it for extra money. Because a lot of us, we either pan for gold or or harvest crystals. That was one of the ways we made money going to going to college. And, and uh, he got tired of carting all this around in his pickup truck. And I, I, at the time, I was running the uh, earthquake center there at the, at the, at the college. And, and so I was recording earthquakes. And eventually, that's what my master's was on, was on uh, using earthquakes to, for crustal refraction. But actually, it was used, using earthquakes for hot water exploration. The first wells I drilled were, were for hot water, uh, geothermal, low temperature geothermal water, which had a real use at the time in a cold climate like Montana. But he set off about a thousand pounds of explosive right south of that M. Now today we'd all go to jail and we would never hear the end of us, but uh, and even at that time it blew windows out for six blocks. Blew all the windows out of the church. Everybody came, every government agency. And the first place they came was where, uh, you know, to the earthquake lab, wonder what it was, you know, is it you know, something, and, and mind you, we all skirted the responsibility, nothing really major happened, thank God. I, I, my comment was, well, we didn't put under a bridge. Uh, but, you know, we always had exposure to different things and, and different things as you go along. So I left that, and my dad was born in San Antonio, or North San Antonio. I had left Montana because my father told me, you cannot eat the scenery. Well, that's too bad. I'm in Montana, and fishing and hunting, and surface geology, the overthrust, uh, I mean, sedimentary basins, it was all right, just right there for your taking. And you go like, well, why not? Because you can't get a job. So go where the job is. So I ended up going right back to San Antonio, which was right where I knew it. I worked for, for, for Teneco. That's where I met Dan Tierpock and many other really good oil finders. And we did a lot of things there. And then FINA sold. I just probably stayed at FINA. This is where my career would have, could have gone different directions. But you know, you're in a major. We used to think majors had security, right? I mean, you used to, they used to always give you a hard time about loyalty to the company. Are you loyal? Well, the other thing is, is, are they loyal to you, right? And then the other thing was, you know, are they going to be around? We, you never know because Tenco at the time had made some of the largest acquisitions of other companies, including Houston Oil Minerals and several others. But it, at the time, we, they, they decided they were going to sell the corporation, 10th largest corporation in uh, the world. People don't realize Tenco was there. We owned, oh, we owned a good part of downtown. We owned Case Tractor, International Harvester at that time. We had Newport News Shipbuilding, submarines, aircraft carriers. For, uh, Apache Corporation of America, my favorite was uh, Sun Giant Fruits and Nuts, the House of Almonds, things like that. We packed, I mean, we just went on Napa Auto Parts and blah, blah, blah. It was diversification because Wall Street said to oh, well, all companies, are, companies need to be diversified. So go diversify yourself. So Tenco did. Uh, Tennessee Pipeline was kind of the root company. But bottom line is, I probably would have stayed. But then they came around and said, we're going to divide it up and sell it. They sold our division uh, with the Gulf Coast Division, went to Fino on Chemical Company. And out of my division, there were five of us. And so I went out to West Texas to run their exploration department thing. And that's a great thing. 
And uh, eventually, and I'll show you why, I eventually gets back around to a whole list of other companies and the reasons I changed. And again, this is really meaningless. You all have one of these things. Really what it says is, I went from a large company, I went overseas, I went to small PE backed companies that I would start up, and then I went to smaller companies that were individually backed. That's my career. That's the career that I would tell anybody. Ultimately, this is what's going to happen. You could stay at an oil company and retire. There's a possibility for that. But there's a great possibility you probably won't do that. And it's, it's fine. It doesn't really mean anything. There's all, all of these things have different benefits. And you need to reap the benefits along the way. If you reap the benefits, you're going to be up like me. Again, your wife thinks you're unemployed because you just sit around and make prospects all day. But you sell them, and you, you drill them, and you keep things going. So when I got into the industry, there, there's all these things on the line, so, and, and we've, we've heard it from Bob and other people. I hate to follow Bob because he tells a lot of great ideas, but on this side, there's a bunch of things that we were we had, and you guys will all understand this. You know, we, we did things, conventional prospecting, vertical drilling. We had magnetics, sometimes 2D seismic, maybe magneto tellurics. Uh, we did surface geology, surface mapping, subsurface mapping. We did hand-drafted maps with pencils, right? All those things we had. We did basic decline curve analysis, what engineers did. We had paper scout tickets. You had to go check them out, check out logs, paper logs. And I put on here, then eventually we started narrow. That was just starting right before I came in, this narrow asthma 3Ds, which we didn't really understand at the time. We thought that was the panacea in the industry. And then, you know, I always put in divining rods because I think that's hilarious. But there's a lot of people still did that. And I, 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 it's just like, oh, uh, look at that. You can go divine for Surface geology found a lot of the big oil fields. And we forget our roots and have, I mean, again, back to contouring maps. And I like the computer to contour, but bottom line is, you, if you don't put a, I bet you can't buy a roll of mylar or sepia <laughs> <laughs> today. I, I'm sorry, I bet you can't. But anyway, and then, then the industry has changed, and all of a sudden we have direct hydrocarbon indications. We have a lot of, of new black boxes come out all the time. We have the internet, of course, risk analysis. We have we have AI now, or, or ML, which is uh, artificial intelligence, which is going to replace us all. You know, we're going to build a computer that's going to do everything we need to do for us, and or machine learning, or big data, or AVO and D, D, DHI, and, and all of those things have, have done just since I've been in the industry. 2D and 3D seismic, high resolution, wide azimuth 3Ds. You guys probably think about that. Seismic attributes, there's hundreds of them. Mer multivariate analysis. Now this is one where you take a bunch of bad com contoured computer maps and you try to figure a relationship out and let the computer give you a result. Ugh. Oh, it's a fantastic deal for, it has application as long as you're feeding it the right amount of information. And we could talk about that for, I have a whole presentation put together for that because many people say, what the hell is that? But, but anyway, so now you, you, can, you can combine this. So we, you know, the answer is combining engineering data with geology data. They don't speak very well, but you know, we're starting to kind of combine them. Geologists start to think about engineering. Engineers are kind of starting to think about geology. But all that stuff, we have you know, all these enhanced type curve deals where you can push a button, send a thousand wells out to, the, to AWS, which is Amazon's web server, and they'll pick the decline curves for you and send them all back in eight seconds. Now what do you do? I mean, it's, there's all, but it doesn't have anything to do with lateral length or completion stages or, or pump rate, anything. It just that it does it for you. Does it work? Computer mapping, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, I tend to got into the computer mapping very early on, and every week as a, they would say, we need to learn about this. So this week you're going to learn, you're going to teach the rest of us at lunch on what uh, 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 co-creating is. And then you're gonna teach us on uh, another contour deal, and we're gonna learn these things and see if they're applicable. That's how we did it. We didn't know anything. We were learning as we went. So you think about the, you know, all of these different things that have come about in our career, our short careers. Okay. Industry's become way more complex. And it, I think it's because we, we have more information than we've ever had before. We have more computing power than we ever thought to have, right? Now, our jobs change because now you have, you need to integrate, but you have so much more information to integrate. It, it becomes, 
that becomes the niche that we learn to be the better prospectors, is being able to do that. There's, that's a, it's a lost art. You guys down here understand that. You know that you know, sometimes it's the paper scout ticket or it's that single paper log that you had may be the key to unlocking your prospect. And you understand that there's times when, when you don't have that, you know what you need to have to make it that much better. Are we teaching that to our kids? I, that's what I focused my entire career on doing right there. And I always say this, if you, if you take the same data set, use the same computers or same computer software to analyze and make the maps, then everybody's going to have exactly the same prospect, which it really isn't a prospect. It's, it's just another map. Hey, we saw this in Eagleford. It's like, I have all the wells. I make all the maps. I got all the ice packs. Now let's go drill the Eagleford. And we realized, like any other shale play, that's not the, the key. So you can't just run it through because everybody runs it through the same way. It's going to get the same answer out the backside. There is no advantage in this industry for that. There's no advantage for us to all do exactly the same thing over and over again. It just doesn't work. Or we're all going to have the same answer. It's going to be all wrong or maybe, some, maybe it's going to be all right. But I think Bob said probably all wrong. So let's talk large companies. We can talk about this. I'm going to go through them real quick. Large companies used to give you great experience. You mean the, it was the Tenneco University or the Exxon University. You'd go to school. You'd get, go to school for four years, come out, and go to school for two years. Cross-discipline training. Uh, everything that was fantastic would build you into those things. Now, unfortunately, sometimes it, it, it pigeonholed you into one particular thing. Geologists don't talk to geophysicists. They don't talk to engineers. They're on a different floor. You want to talk to them. You've got to go to their manager, go up to there. It didn't have integration. It gave you great regional experience and the opportunity to see the world. It, yeah, it's like going to join the Navy. We could go on and on about what big companies bring to you. It gave me a solid footing to advance my college career. And then this happened. This is uh, Tenneco and you know, I'm a, a, a you know, young, probably too young exploration manager. And I got this, this note came in from the chief geophysicist and it said on a recent visit to the divisions, I discovered that your geophysicist, me, I was him, uh, we're using geology to help interpret seismic data. And then he goes on to say, and I, I didn't name him because he, but unfortunately he's so long since gone, but, but it, you know, he goes, I hope this, this isn't the norm for the divisions. I knew right there, this, this is, this, it's over. It's over. I, I didn't know what to do. I got one compliment from them, and that was on that 23,000 foot well we drilled outside of San Antonio. Because what happened was, I had, we just drilled a, uh, a well in Terrell County, at Tenneco Transition to FINA, uh, we had behind pipe pay. So the manager, the division manager, Kennedy says, well, what's this going to make? I said, well, you know, it's Canyon Sands, uh, you know, BCF, maybe two BCF uh, per well. I said, nah. He says, we're, so we, he says, we're not in the business at, at FINA to drill 100 wells to get 100 BCF. I want to drill one well to get 100 BCF. So that's going to be really tough to do. It's very tough to do. We sold that to Malone Mitchell for $50,000 in plugging liability, and he built Packenham Field. Sold it a few years later for 83 million bucks. Became walkout of the year. Then, then he comes back to us, and, and another prospect of mine, because I, I love the overthrust. I grew up walking the overthrust in Montana. And we, we, we developed a, uh, a pinion field in the South Fort Stockton. And uh, we had drilled some offsets right towards the closure. And then we were kind of developing it with a, a few people and, and drilled a few wells. And they were, they were pretty spectacular. I mean, you're getting 40 BCF of gas at 6,500 feet. What the, what that, that's a fantastic deal. I mean, there's the place to be. They didn't like the geologic risk. Steep beds, bad seismic, blah, blah, blah. And that's when uh, this uh, gentleman had come to me and I had taken a seismic line that really didn't have any reflectors on it. It had a little heat and a little air. And I basically had been out on the outcrop looking at what the overthrust looked like south of, of around Marathon. And I saw, you know, look, if this thing is thrust up here and this one's here, where did all the other material go? So for every anticline that you had from the two, the caballos, you had to have twice as many from the shallow to make it fit. We balanced them out, we did all stuff. So you people go like, well, it, it balances 80 miles south. Well, they didn't move that far. So you take that, you go, so we basically, I interpreted that seismic line knowing the fact that if this is Caballos with a well point, and this is Caballos, and this is a second Caballos, then they and then they're like this, 
then you have to have all these things in between. And I used, I think I used a, a, high, a, a pink highlighter. It was the most ridiculous thing I did because it was a concept deal. He blows up and accuses us of using geology. So it's like, I'm done here. So I started thinking, you know, I'm moving down the road. So what's, what am I going to do? So, you know, let's go overseas. So I, I said, I'm, 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 I'm done with this. And I left the industry. I left that. I left them. I went and started, actually started a company uh, uh, doing 3Ds and developing 3D technology because I saw that to be a real big feature for the industry. At the same time, I said, you know what? Fiend is never going to make it, so I'm just going to buy it. So I went overseas, got together with a group, and we made a run at buying Fino Oil and Chemical US. And we got real close, we got to within like 100 million bucks, it was a billion, billion two. And finally, we, our backers said, we just can't do this. But since you're here, you wouldn't mind representing us in some other countries. So I, uh, yeah, what the hell, you know, I'm, I'm over here, you know, I'm in Ireland. I was working for the Irish government. I you know, thought, hey, this is great. Next thing I have is I have an Irish passport and I'm in Iraq. You can go as a U.S. citizen back then. We were on our way to Baghdad. We had flown to Tehran, drove to Baghdad when Clinton bombed Baghdad. And I was like, oh crap, I really want to be here. And I was single, it didn't really matter a whole bunch. But from there I went into Russia. Uh, back, I've back, been in Iraq three times since then, in different prospects, some great prospects too. Really good, I mean, we were drilling wells in Iraq with surface geology, I mean, you were mapping the anticlines and looking at the oil seeps and then deciding where to drill wells. And I think the last one we drilled was like 6,000 barrels a day. It's a big well, northern, actually Kurdistan. But you know, Siberia, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. I remember Kazakhstan, a real quick story. Kazakhstan, I'm going in, in Kazakhstan and I'm still relatively, I think, a young kid. I'm standing, we actually knew we had this, uh, this uh, concession in the Zazon Basin. Most people don't know where that is. It's right next to China. And if you go back in your history and, and think about what was going on back then, I mean, the Kazakhs were kind of blended people. There's a whole bunch of different races in that country, and very much Mongol in some cases, but a lot of Russians. And they had invited Stalin to come in and protect him from the Chinese. And he moved the border 10 kilometers into China, a show of force, you know, Stalin. He killed about 40% of the people there. And they drilled a well on the border of the Kazakh-China border in that, not right off the disputed area, found this huge fountain of oil. Now we come in, we're coming in of course 40 years later, but for Stalin it became, oh crap, maybe I just set myself up for an invasion from China, another oil field. And so he decided I'll make it a tight hole. Stalin's idea of a tight hole was to kill everybody involved. <laughs> Literally, they, they, they went out, they shot everybody on the rig, buried the rig, went in the office, got rid of everybody. Literally, got rid of them. So now we come in later, we've been in Moscow, we've been in the archives, we knew this well existed, we don't get this well, I mean, this, this is key. So we go in and we're, 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 we're staying in Almaty, and we're, we're going out to the little lab and we keep asking these guys, I mean, we had this concession, I want that log, I need the, wow, I need this, and, yeah, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, we kept on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Pretty soon we're thinking, this is a waste of time, right? Finally, I just said, look, I, between myself and the, the two guys that are with me, I said, look, what do we have about $3,000 American cash with us or something? I said, look, if we just generally announced to the group, and then we, we've been eating, I mean, we've been living out there eating beets and potatoes and horse meat and trying to just survive. And, and you know, and I just like, I, I really had an apartment over there. So like, I'm, I'm ready. This We need to get this done and move on. And so I wanted to just look at I'll just tell everybody here, I have $3,000 at American hard currency. If anybody finds a map or a log, I'll be outside with my driver under the tree. <laughs> foreign corrupt practices always comes into play. You think, is that foreign corrupt practices? Technically, if you're buying data like that, it's not, but it's, a, it's on the line. This guy comes out with a trench coat up to our van. Show me the money. Opens his up, he's got logs, maps, everything we need to develop our prospect. They drilled it later on, it was a very successful deal. We were drilling it with uh, Kuwaiti money. That's a whole other story. So international experience, the reason they tell you to go international, because every year you spend over there is worth two years here. Or every year over there takes two years off your life. 
you know, and so I, I, I you know, got to, you know, so I still go back. I still have great, great friends in a lot of countries, and, and unfortunately, my geologist in Kazakhstan uh, uh, drank himself to death. I mean, he's a great geologist, wrote the book on the minerals of, ge of, uh, of, of Kazakhstan and, and, and signed it for me when I was over there. I get to keep that one. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, they, they just, it's just a hard life. It was a hard life for us. You bring your own toilet paper, because if you didn't have toilet paper, boy, I'll tell you what, that's what it teaches you. It teaches diversity. It teaches you to do things without support. Now, of course, you can go to anywhere and get Pringles and whatever you want. But back then, you probably couldn't do that. We couldn't. We, we, but anyway, so then I started going to PE back companies, small companies. So we came back and said, all right, now we've got all these different tools, seismic being the big one. So this is, a, this is actually a, a, an article, a picture of an article with a, with a, with a train. This is, this is in the, the Barnett. I, I went to work for the, for the Bass family because you work for big wealthy family members, what's that? What, they got all kinds of money in the world. Well, until they sell the oil company, which eventually they did. But you learn a lot from, so again, when you're developing that career, it's like, I want to learn from somebody who's got made money. Then I want to learn from a guy who's not that big, who's still made money. And ultimately, someday, maybe you'll be that guy. But we started taking technology and finding places to apply it. And it wasn't, the t it wasn't taking you know, a, a, a square peg and trying to force it into a round a, a hole, which a lot of us do in prospecting. You've got, to, you've got to take it. So we said, all right, what's the most innovative technology? Eventually, it, we, you know, we felt like it 3D. So I had been acquiring 3D in West Texas. I knew 3D. I knew how to design them. I knew what the pitfalls were. I knew how to get them permitted. You know, I acquired and I knew the process and decided out. So we started doing 3Ds. Eventually, we ended up with 15,000 square miles of, of data in the Gulf Coast and drilled a ton of, of, of very, ton of very good wells. Uh, not always successful, but more often than not, because we stayed above pressure. Uh, because the history of the company is such that if they drilled below pressure, they blew out, and that company didn't have the knowledge to, and eventually they lost their, uh, 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 their insurance for blowout prevention. So you take the technology, and eventually we took that technology to Europe, and. And we, and we put that in, uh, in, in Hungary at 5 million acres over there and in other places where you knew you could take. This technology works really well. Find a place to apply it that you know can work very well for you. And you can afford it, but I mean, it, but along the way we said, you know, seismic's not where it needs to be yet. It's not there. We need more. We need more channels. It's like having an a, a iPhone 2 versus an iPhone, what is it, last week, 11. It's a better camera. We want a better image. So we actually decided we're going to build the equipment to do, again, it's a failed path, but a learning experience, uh, build equipment that would do that. And so we started what became the cableless seismic revolution. And, and that little orange box right there is one of them. And just for fun, I, I had a whole bunch of these boxes at my disposal. So I laid them out along this railroad track, and I used the train to, to generate me a 3D line with no source. I used the train to do it. Process of convolution and things. It's a very interesting technique. You published a article about it a long time ago, but bottom line is, is that, hey, you know, let's try it, see what happens. Uh, but bottom line, we built this equipment. Of course, the industry just like, oh, they were, oh geophys you guys are not geophysicists. You guys, are, we have to see our data. We have to see it recorded. We want to see it on the screen when it's being recorded. We want to, you know, it was uh, 10,000 naysayers. And we said, we, don't, we, we want to have 5,000 channels not 240. We want to have 10,000 channels. We want to record everything that goes on the whole time. We want to build high resolution, high density data sets. What you're actually seeing today, if you look at data from the, even the 80s, 90s, even early 2000s in West Texas to what you're seeing today with these large component systems, we built that technology, but we just didn't know enough about the business to stay in the business. We, we spent some money, it wasn't very expensive, but bottom line, it was a failure for us, it was a gain for the industry. We, because now everybody's cable. It's all, it just, I asked the guys here earlier, would you, who, who did you use? They well, use Breckenridge, the guy runs Breckenridge, a good friend of mine, and yeah, they use cable systems. We built that technology. We said, if we can't get what we want, we'll go do it ourselves, and we did that. But we weren't gonna make any money on it. We acquired a lot of good data with it. So you, you, when you get to this PE back, and this is the time when the Barnett's just starting out, and you're going like, hey, guys, we go to PE company and say, I'm gonna, I want to, I want, you just need to be in the Barnett. Why? Because it's, we called it uh, slow gas. Uh, Gulf Coast, fast gas. You know, when it hits water, wells go offline. 
Barnett, slow gas, got a long tail, loans on forever. Yeah, okay. All the economics. We've promoted the PE company two thirds for a third. They paid two thirds of, of, of the cost of the land and all the work up to the point, and then we were heads up on the wells. Two thirds for a third. You couldn't get that today. You'd be, they'd laugh you right out of here. Well, now they'll laugh you out anyway, but <laughs> you, you, you know, when you get to these things, you're, you're limited, you're, you're, your flexibility is limited, but you, then you've got to be a self-starter. You've got to be thinking about how do I get that done? Who's going to fund it? it you know, and you're very subject to market conditions. And the other thing people don't think about, too, is that is not a long-term career, not with any one PE group because they have an exit. They're going to repay their investors, and that you can go on maybe get refunded because they always want to keep you in debt. Right? I mean, it's the, the model is like, uh, okay, we're going to sell the company. You, you, each of you guys at this table, you all made a little bit of money. That's great. You all go get a little, little money in your pocket. Now we want to loan you twice as much money, and we want you to take that little bit of money and put it back in. It's, it's, it, you want to get off the carousel with still some money in your pocket. Because that's the PE companies just continues well. If they're not replacing that money, taking it, giving it back to the investors, having the investors give it back to them, they're not making their money off of it. That's the business they're in. Return to their investors. We're just tools. And, and now that market's changed again. It's subject to those market conditions. Where is it going to go? Well, you know, it's not going to go back to uh, unconventional place. Is it going to go to conventional place? It's a possibility, but it's not going to take any risk. Now they've had unconventional wells. There is no risk in an unconventional well. Come on, every well we drill is going to make hydrocarbons. That's what we hear. That's what we've been told. That's kind of sometimes what's what we say. Not necessarily the care. But so there's not a career, a lifelong career. So you've got to be almost on an upstart every three to five years. You can do it again. I've done it like four times. So then individual backed. And here's where you have to have, now you have to have that toolbox of knowledge because you don't have a mentor out there. You might. I, I do some great ideas. You go find a mentor that you like, and there's some mentors I have in this room right here that I know very well, uh, four or five, and, and you go get those people. You ask them questions. You go on. But you have to have ideas, and you have to have some sort of maybe asset ready to go to do this, right? You are very limited in what you can do. You have lots and lots of information, but you have a lot more limits on, on, on building it. So think about it. Well, I'll do 3Ds. Where am I going to do a 3D? Maybe I'll do a 3D, just exactly what the guy's talking about today, find a place. Uh, that has very good opportunity and go back and reapply that model. Actually, today's times, the 3D that we acquired in the Gulf Coast could be redone today with a new image. And it would be old and new, and you're going to find more prospects. They're going to be a little bit riskier, and some of them will have already been drilled, but you will get better images. You'll get better ABO analysis. You'll get a lot of things you didn't have even 10 years ago. That's what they're doing in West Texas. I mean, they, re they shot, I mean, gosh darn. Reeves and Pecos County have been, you can still fly over it and see where the 2D lines used to be. I mean, think about it. We were doing 2D out there, and we were doing nine arm stars. Nine arms. So you did nine arms. You can't even draw a nine arm star. Nine arm stars. Each, each element, had, each, each arm had six holes drilled in it. Each hole had 30 pounds of explosive in it. And they're 900 feet across. And when you set that off, boy, you can feel it. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's almost as good as when I was in college and we blew up the mountain. But bottom line is those scars still exist. And a lot of people are like, oh, you're never going to do seismic my land again. That's what it took to overcome the complications of the geophysical technology at the time. Now it's different. Now these 3D assets are coming in over, we, I shot uh, Waha Lockridge three times and it came in. Each time you're like, holy cow, it's an entirely new picture. It doesn't solve all the problems with the seismic. And one of the things at Atenco was, what does seismic really see, and what does it take to image it? And, and, and they go, OK, you know, West Texas, vertical wells, and all faults are vertical. And we know that's not true. And then when you go, well, how, how do you explain these overturn beds? Oh, it's an anomaly. And you go, well, that's not. That's, that's a pattern. That's how we became successful. Atenco. We discovered the pattern, and then we went out and started drilling wells off, and we were very successful at it. Again, this is not a career position. This is going to be your livelihood for the rest of your life, but it may not be a career position. So this is where I find myself. I wanted to be here. I wanted to be in a position where I had a bit more say-so. You're always limited to, unless, like I used to say, we don't, there's not an I in, 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 in what we do. It's a we. You don't do anything by yourself. 
unless you have all the money in the world and all the technology and all the brilliance in the world, you don't have that. So you always have a we. It was always a we. You never team, the teams we had at Tenneco was always we. We did this, we did that, we did, because it wasn't just you. It was a landman, an engineer, it was a drilling guy. It was, you know, all the different facets of the industry. The sales guy, I mean, everybody was in there. So it was a we, it was a we group. And, that, and that's one of the things that's hard to get over. That's the ego thing. You want to be I, but it's not. It's us, and, and we go down the road. We all make each other that more intelligent. So a few things for me, what's, like, what's next, you're right. I, I like generating prospects. I found through 30 years generating prospects is the most fun that I've had in this history. And applying technology or developing technology to do that gives me that ability to, to do it better, I hope. Got to use the tools that are available. Horizontal wells, 3D seismic, I don't care what it is, the tools are there. And as we go along, we'll find new tools, better tools, but you must educate yourself to be able to use those tools. Or find somebody that's a partner with you that brings that expertise. That's another thing about you know doing this. You need some pretty good partners, good partners. Not partners that'll stab you in the back, not partners that'll take your checkbook and run off, or your wife. Uh, it didn't happen to me, but, but I don't know guys. But anyway, so you take that and you say, let's go with that. You're gonna be smaller investors, smaller deals, be much harder to get them done because it's going to require a lot more of that salesmanship that they don't teach in college, which is probably what they do. They, they don't, I mean, some colleges don't even take, make people take pre, uh, a presentation skills class. Tenneco, we developed one and then we furthered it at FINA because we knew people, they couldn't communicate to their team members even, let alone to management or to investors. We sold prospects from, at Tenneco, we've, I've always sold prospects to other companies because some managers feel more comfortable if somebody else is putting money in too. That's the way I got with, with, with Perry Bass. Uh, you always have, always look for good partners in, in how you develop that out. So a few uh, things, what's next for me? I, I'm, I'm really fascinated, the Austin Chalk's taken off on its own now. Uh, I'm really fascinated with uh, tight gas sands. Something that we've looked at since the 50s, probably uh, all over, every basin's got them. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to take the technology, the tools we've developed, Moon that horizontal wells for one, high density fracks, and reapply it to source rocks. Conventional, unconventional? I think it's conventional. But it's more of an unconventional technology applied to conventional. That's the direction I think the industry's probably more like guys like us would probably go. I mean, I love 3D and I'd love to go out and do a bunch of big 3Ds, but that takes a bunch to do it. Two years, three years, but it, it's in the possibilities. Um, and then I, I kind of, I have a couple last slides and I'll get off, off the podium. Uh, so this one, this one, uh, another geologist that I had the pleasure of knowing for a few years. As I read the historical curve of the industry for North America, it is now uh, near the crest of maximum production, uh, yeah, peak oil. Uh, a few years, three years, five years, present rate of production will, main, will be maintained and then a long gradual decline will come. Possibly the permanent decline in production will begin about the time the world's business relations will have entered a period of permanent recovery from the present disrupted conditions in which we prevail. And then he goes on, because the most evident places will have been tested, less promising ones will be tried, more failures will be encountered, are encountered, profits will be lessened, that's what we're seeing in the unconventionals now. Financiers' enthusiasm for low business will decrease, uh, but you know we got five or ten years, right? Um, during the, this period, excellently trained, experienced geologists will be in demand, exclusively for geologic work. Guys, we have five to ten years. And as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. That was uh, E.G. Woodruff in an A.P.G. Bolton in 1921. It, this isn't where we are. It's not anything new. It becomes discipline disciplined explorers, that, that's what's going to find the next generation of deals. Every time we think we've, I can tell you how many times I heard it say that I'll drink the last barrel of oil that comes out of the Delaware Basin. Um, and then I, I, this one I, I put in there, because this used to be a lot longer, it's kind of a pig Latin uh, term, uh, uh, but basically it means don't let them grind you down, because this industry will grind you down if you don't have a positive attitude and enthusiasm. It, we will beat you up, it will spit you out. And that's what I think you're gonna see with these young kids leaving the companies. They're, they feel like they're just getting beat on. The demands are too high, there's too much data, too much this, too much that. It's the enthusiasm that drives, it's the enthusiasm that drives people in this room, no doubt. You guys would not have been here this long had you not had some enthusiasm for what we do. 
A uh, few passing thoughts, uh, your technical discipline, it matters. You've got to be up, up you, you've got to know these things. Or you have to have somebody that knows these things. Uh, remember the deal about too much information. Uh, I fear this is hitting us and probably hitting our, our, our kids, if you call them millennials or whatever else. Uh, there's so much readily available, and I see it hurts us too, is there's so much readily available information and technology that you don't have an off time. We're always on. We're always on the phone. We're getting updates from LinkedIn. We're getting updates from Hearts. We're getting updates. We, we're always on. We're, there is no off. It's important to have that. It will make you fresher. We used to require everybody to take one week solid vacation. One week. Unplug. Go away. Don't, don't call the office. This is, you had to. No prospect before it's time. I've said this many times. I know several people have heard me say it. Sometimes you want that prospect to happen and sometimes it's not going to happen. Don't marry it. It will happen. Keep good archives. Document your data. Maybe that land's not available today. Five years from now, hey, that family's changed generations and the young kids want to lease the land. It's available now. So those prospects don't necessarily grow old. They just have to come to their time. Maybe you didn't have an offset log. Maybe you couldn't find a scout ticket. It, just remember, they come back around. I mean, a lot of times we find a lot of oil and gas. What did um, Perry Bass say? He said something along the lines of finding oil and gas. Everybody should be in oil and gas business. Finding oil and gas is, he says, like finding dog turds. If you find one pile, there'll be another one near, nearby. I mean, he, just, he, he, he had to relate down to who he was talking to, and he was not really a geologist anyway. But be tolerant. Remember, this business is that. I put together some 14 things, but you know, all of them, I think the 10 of them are covered in what he said. But you know, character is big in, in this business. Enjoy creativity, enjoy figuring out things. That's what I teach my grandkids. You, you know, be, be curious, ask questions. You know, the pleasure of working with good people. You can go down, I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, firm deadlines, I always like that was, firm deadlines are powerful motivators for all of us. I mean, it's like the, the last minute, if you feel like you've got to it, if we don't in this industry, sometimes we'll, the 80-20 rule falls in, but if you've done the 80% hard work, you're down to the last 20%, and sometimes you just have to say, okay, a deadline says, let's move forward to the next step. Don't just continue to get into this deal that companies get into now where it's just procrastination uh, overload. They just, it's, they just don't get anything done. They're just worried about too much. Um, you know, the merit of patience is out there. Uh, you got to be kind. Let's face it. Uh, you know, this industry is not suitable to the way it was in the 70s and 80s when we were out against everybody's throats. You know, NAEP would not have happened in the 70s. You would never show a prospect without some sort of powerful CA involved at NAEP. It wasn't going to happen. Time changed that. Um, but Time is critical. So I kind of, the next last one is, you know, the, the worth of uh, fleetness of time, you know. We're all getting older. And that's just one thing that we can't get back. It's a commodity we don't have a, a long deal. I always like that, uh, the priority of those who you love. And yeah, I love the industry. It's my priority. I love my family and my grandkids. Make those a priority. We do this for money, wealth. I have to be rich. But we have to prioritize. You have to plan your career. I had a day timer, and it said along the way, have 2.5 kids. You know, you get married, have 2.5 kids, blah, 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 blah. So I was filled out. I, I, I had my plan. And, you know, I'm getting there. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, got it back to John Wayne. John Wayne's, uh, it's called the Duke. That's my middle name, Duke. I always go back to John Wayne, and I go back to this uh, gentleman I had the pleasure of working with in West Texas, uh, who was a dowser. And uh, you know, I, I actually doused for water in Cyprus, another story a long time for, for a guy in, in, in Cyprus. I actually found water in Cyprus, which was a pretty big deal for the poor guy. Uh, but uh, bottom line is, you know, uh, no, nothing's black and white. Sometimes you just say, what the hell, let's get going. So. That's what I leave you with. I have a cut. If we're about out of time. Yes. Okay. So I, I'm, as usual, they know me well. She always tells me to cut my slides down. Um, I hope you enjoyed some of the pictures in the background because they're all meaningful to me. But you know, enjoy the profession. And I was hoping there's a lot more younger kids here. But you know, that's what I do when I go to San Diego State is try to teach these kids 
this passion. So that's that's what I have. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tom.